Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Hope you're having a good Sunday. I want to do this backstory on Rex Hewerman, who has been arrested and charged with the murder of three women, and he is the prime suspect in a fourth. This is an older case, but as you know, in this day and age, you don't get away for long. Music fact of the day, I want to thank um, Homo Spacian, which is a great name for this fact. Aerosmith has earned more money from Guitar Hero, which is a video game, than any of their albums. That is crazy, but not surprising. That was actually a really fun game. I felt like a rock star playing it. All right, so let's jump right in. Rex Hewerman, who is 59 years old now, he's been charged in the murders of three women whose bodies were found near a roadway in New York. He's now facing three charges of first degree and second degree murder in connection with the deaths of Melissa Bartelemy, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. All the women were believed to have been sex workers and they would post ads on social media sites such as Craigslist looking for clients. He's also the prime suspect in a fourth woman's murder. Her name is Maureen Bernard Barnes. She was found in similar circumstances as the other three victims. They say they expect a resolution in her case very soon, so it sounds like they are pretty close to announcing charges for her. This all began on December 11th of 2010 when police officer... John Malia was conducting a training exercise with his canine partner, whose name was Blue, on Ocean Parkway in Gilgo Beach, New York. During the training exercise, Blue discovered a set of human remains, which were later identified as Melissa's. Two days later, on December 13th of 2010, the search continued in very close proximity of where Melissa's remains were found. They found three additional sets of human remains within a quarter mile of where Melissa's remains were found. The victims were Megan Waterman and Amber Costello. Homicidal violence was the cause of death. All of the victims were petite and between the ages of 22 and 27 years old. Each victim was found in similar positions, bound by either belts or tape, and three of the victims were wrapped in this burlap-type material. All three women have been placed between 22 and 33 feet from the edge of the parkway. They all three had missing clothing as well as personal possessions. Each victim had been in contact shortly before their disappearance with a person using a burner phone. The cell phones of Maureen and Melissa had been used by the killer after their deaths. Now, due to the decomposition of the remains, there was little that could be determined as far as cause of death. But in 2011, FBI profiled the killer as sadistic but charming, your average Joe who could blend into any environment unnoticed. The profiler told the New York Times that the killer was likely financially stable and bright. We've learned that about Rex Hewerman. We'll get into that shortly. They also say he may have sought treatment at a hospital for poison ivy infection. As part of his job or interest, he has access to or a stockpile of burlap sacks. In January of 2022, the Suffolk County DA's office assigned a seasoned team of investigators from all over, analysts and prosecutors to work jointly with law enforcement to try to break this cold case. They did a comprehensive review of every item of evidence and information they had at the time. On March 14th of last year, two months into the joint investigation, a first-generation Chevy Avalanche was registered to Rex at the time of the murders. This is significant because this comes in later. It was seen at one of the victim, Amber's house, the night before she was killed. And also, again, she was seen by a witness that next night walking towards an area where she is believed to have gotten into the Chevy Avalanche to meet Rex. There's a bit of the backstory. We'll go into that. This led the team to focus on Rex and over 300 subpoenas were sent. Search warrants, other legal processes were done to obtain evidence. In short, all this evidence uncovered led to Rex's arrest just last week in Midtown Manhattan, right there on the side of the street. Burner cell phones were used to arrange the meetings with three of the four victims, and taunting calls made to relatives 
of Melissa were placed after she was killed. There was also a call made by a detective to Melissa's cell phone while looking into her disappearance. Calls checking voicemail on Maureen's phone after her disappearance were made. Now, Maureen is the one that they say he is the prime suspect in, but has not been charged as of right now. Rex lived in Massapequa Park, where the victims were believed to have disappeared from. He worked in Midtown Manhattan, which is in his office was kind of right near the Empire State Building and in the vicinity where those taunting calls were made to the sister, mainly of Melissa, after her murder. Rex is believed to be the person who used the burner phones to communicate with each of the four victims prior to their disappearance and also who used Melissa and Maureen's phones after their deaths. Both Rex and the burner phones had significant connections to both Midtown Manhattan and Massapequa Park, New York. That's kind of a suburb of Long Island, by the way. So let's look into the disappearance of Maureen Bernard Barnes. She was contacted by a burner phone 16 times between July 6th and 9th of 2007. She was last seen alive on July 9th, 2007, and was believed to be a sex worker. The last cell site location for her phone was at 11.56 p.m. in Midtown Manhattan near the 59th Street Bridge. There was no further activity on her cell phone until July 12th when two calls were made to check voicemails. Those calls were placed in the vicinity of the Long Island Expressway. Now, the disappearance and murder of Melissa Bartholomew. She was last seen on July 10th, 2009 in New York City. At that time, she was believed to be a sex worker. She was contacted by the burner phone on July 3rd, the 6th, the 9th, and the 10th of 2009. On July 10th, cell phone records indicate the burner phone traveled from Massapequa Park to Midtown Manhattan. Later that evening, Melissa's cell phone traveled from Midtown Manhattan to Massapequa, which was the last cell tower ping on July 11th at 1.43 a.m. Between July 11th and the 12th of 2007, the phone was used to make three outbound calls checking Melissa's voicemails and the cell tower locations were in Freeport and Babylon. Taunting calls were made from Melissa's phone by the killer to her family on July 17th, the 23rd, August 5th, August 19th, and the 26th of 2009. The killer admitted to assaulting and killing Melissa. The location of the calls were from Midtown Manhattan, which ended up being a very short distance away from where Rex's Midtown Manhattan office was. The disappearance and murder of Megan Waterman. Megan was last seen alive at the Holiday Inn in Hop Hog, New York, on June 6, 2010 at 1.30 a.m. She was also believed to be a sex worker. On June 5th of 2010, her cell phone was contacted by another burner phone, which had been activated that same day, and that phone communicated with Megan on June 6, 2010 at 1.31 a.m. Now, Megan was seen on surveillance camera leaving the Holiday Inn for the last time. She was never seen again. Following that communication, the burner phone had no further phone activity. Cell records show Megan's phone traveled to Massapequa Park with the last cell location being in the vicinity of Rex's home at 3.11 a.m. The disappearance and murder of Amber Costello, September 1st, 2010. The burner phone had contact with Amber's phone at 11.33 p.m. and 11.34 p.m. The burner phone connected to cell site towers in West Amityville and Massapequa Park. Rolling over into September 2nd of 2010, the phone was pinged in the vicinity of Amber's home. And the burner phone contacted her phone at 12.05 a.m. Witnesses say at the time of the communications with the burner phone, a prostitution client showed up at Amber's residence in West Babylon, New York, in a first-generation Chevy Avalanche, which is the truck that Rex owned, and it is seen in the driveway of her home. The car would actually become their first major clue that Rex could be involved. After the client believed to be Rex entered the home, there was a ruse executed where a person pretending to be Amber's outraged boyfriend and the client left the home. Amber kept the money that the client had brought to pay for her services. The client was described as a large white male between 6'4 and 6'6 in his mid-40s 
with dark bushy hair and big oval 1970s type sunglasses. He was described as looking like an ogre, which matches the description of Rex, who is six foot six and over 240 pounds with dark bushy hair and wears large sunglasses. He was 46 at the time Amber went missing. After the ruse, the client said that he was Amber's friend and tell her I'll give her a call and walked out the front door. At 1.18 a.m., just after all this happened, the burner phone sent a text to Amber's phone saying that was not a nice thing to do. I get credit for next time. The phone was in Massapequa Park within two minutes of the text being sent. A witness said the same day, because remember this rolled over between the first and the second into the early morning hours. On September 2nd, Megan was contacted again by the same client. And a witness told investigators Amber told them that he wanted to see her again, but did not want to come back to the house because of her boyfriend. At 9.32 p.m., the same burner phone communicated with Amber's phone using a cell phone tower in Midtown Manhattan, which is where his office was. The burner phone traveled to Massapequa Park and had contact with Amber's phone at 10.39 and 11.05 p.m. Cell records show at 11.17, the phone traveled to the proximity of Amber's home. Amber left her cell phone behind, walked out of the front door, and was never seen alive again. Shortly after Amber left the house, a witness saw a dark-colored truck, a Chevy Avalanche, pass the house coming from the direction Amber had walked towards. So they look into records establishing that Rex's wife was out of town for the disappearances of Melissa, Megan, and Amber. He is married, and she actually was at his arraignment. Melissa disappeared on July 10th, 2009. Rex's wife was in Iceland from July 8th to August 18th, 2009. Megan disappeared on June 6th, 2010. Rex's wife was in Maryland from June 4th through June the 8th. And then Amber disappeared on September 2nd, 2010. Rex's wife was in New Jersey from August 28th through September 5th. Let's look at the cell phone records for Rex. Cell records for the burner phone used to contact Maureen were not obtained at the time of her disappearance and unfortunately no longer exist. At the time the victims disappeared, Rex owned an architectural business in Midtown Manhattan and the business was the named subscriber of Rex's personal cell phone and was active during the time of the victims' disappearances. The address of the subscribed was Rex's home address in Massapequa Park. Although cell records from that time period no longer existed, investigators found billing statements and also his American Express records showing numerous instances where Rex was located in the same general area as those burner phones that were used to contact Megan, Melissa, and Amber, and the use of Melissa's cell phone when they were used to check voicemails and make taunting calls after the women disappeared. Investigators could find no instance where Rex was in a separate location from the burner phones when a communication occurred. For example, on July 10th, 2009, when Melissa was last seen alive, both the burner phone and Rex's personal phone were in the Massapequa area and traveled together towards the city. Then both Melissa's phone and Rex's phone traveled eastbound toward Massapequa. July 14th, 2009 at 7.15 p.m., the burner phone used to contact Melissa prior to her disappearance showed activity in Manhattan. At the same time, Rex's phone was also in Manhattan between 6.58 p.m. and 7.22 p.m. So right there in the middle is when that burner phone used to contact Melissa. His phone's right there. Following Melissa's disappearance on July 17th, 2009, at 12.40 p.m., a male caller used her phone to contact her family. Melissa's phone was located in New York City, pinging 2,372 feet away from Rex's office, which at the time was located on 19 West 36th Street. On the same date at 1.45 p.m., Rex's cell phone showed a call that was placed in New York City. July 22nd, 2009, at 5.12 p.m., Rex's phone listed a call in New York City. Then at 651, the burner phone had activity in the city and pinged off the tower at 19 West 36th Street. 
This call was placed 872 feet from Rex's office. July 23rd, 2009, at 1.39 p.m., a burner phone had activity in New York and pinged off of a tower 872 feet from Rex's office. At 6.42 p.m., a male caller used Melissa's personal phone to contact her family. Her phone was 872 feet from Rex's office when that call was placed. Less than two hours later at 8.29 and 9.30 p.m., the burner phone had activity in New York City. At 11.05 p.m., Rex's phone listed a call in Jamaica, Queens. On August 5, 2009, between 6.50 and 7.11 p.m., a male caller used Melissa's phone to contact her family. The calls were 2,230 to 3,280 feet from Rex's office. Between 6.46 and 7.05 p.m., his phone was in New York City. August 10th, 2009, based on travel documents, Rex departed for Iceland and all phone activity for Melissa's phone stopped. August 18th, 2009, Rex returns from Iceland and phone activity for Melissa's phone resumed the next day on August 19th when her phone was again used to call her family at 723 at a distance of 2,831 feet from Rex's office. His phone was in New York City between 7.16 and 7.28 p.m. that day. August 26, 2009, 11.29 a.m. to 11.34 a.m., Melissa's phone was used to contact her family. The phone was 2,230 feet away from Rex's office. Rex's phone was in New York City at 11.38 a.m. So they're just correlating these calls to the family and the burner phone activity to Rex's phone being in the same vicinity as where these calls were placed. Back in 2011, the New York Times ran a story on this case revealing that Melissa's teenage sister was the recipient of the calls and said the calls never lasted for more than three minutes. He would taunt her, asking if she thought she would ever be able to speak to her sister again. She answered that she hoped she would, and Melissa's mother said he kept them hopeful in all calls except the last call where he confirmed their worst fears. He told Melissa's sister that he had assaulted and killed her and then hung up a few seconds later. And now a word from our sponsor of the week, easycanvasprints.com. Canvas prints make the perfect decor for any home. They're the perfect way to make your best memories last a lifetime. Are you looking to turn cherished memories into stunning home decor? Easy Canvas Prints is the perfect way to transform your favorite pictures into beautiful masterpieces. With Easy Canvas Prints, you can bring your memories to life, adding a touch of elegance and personalization to any space. Whether it's a family portrait, a breathtaking landscape, or a candid moment captured in time, canvas prints will make your walls come alive. Ordering your custom canvas print is a breeze. All you do is visit easycanvasprints.com and upload your favorite photo. You can customize the size, borders, and even a custom wooden or metallic frame to create a unique piece of art. Don't wait to elevate your home or office decor with a custom canvas print today. Visit easycanvasprints.com slash pretty lies for a special offer for my listeners. Get unlimited 16 by 20 canvas prints for only $14.99 each. Again, that's easycanvasprints.com slash pretty lies. Mary Ellen O'Toole, who is a former agent with the FBI, told the New York Times it's unusual behavior for a killer to contact the victim's families. She said it's just not a smart move to put yourself in the middle of that investigation when really you should be running for the hills. Investigators found a number of online accounts and burner phones linked to Rex and were signed up for in fictitious names that were used for illicit activities. American Express records show recurring Google Play payments to Tinder, which is the dating app, and it was found to be set up under the name Andy. Now, Rex's middle name is Andrew. That Tinder account was linked to a burner phone subscribed to the fake name Andrew Roberts using an email account springfieldman9 at AOL.com. The AOL account was established January 15th of 2011 with the name John Springfield with an Astoria, Queens zip code. The AOL account used another burner cell phone number with no named subscriber. Rex's regular cell phone was used on December 11th of last year 
for over three hours to access that Springfield Benign AOL account. T-Mobile records show a burner phone showed that both his personal cell phone and the burner phone were used extensively between 2021 and 2023 for prostitution-related contacts for either sex workers or massage parlors. Just like with the burner phones used to contact the victims prior to their disappearance, these two additional burner phones had frequent cell phone activity in Midtown Manhattan and Massapequa Park, with the phones pinging off of towers that provided coverage to his home as well as his office in the city. A Google search warrant revealed another junk email account, thawk090672 at gmail.com, using the fake name Thomas Hawk. It was associated with a burner phone that was used to conduct thousands of searches, which were related to sex workers, sadistic, torture-related pornography, and also child abuse materials. I won't read those searches online here because they're terrible. Documents are on my website. I put them up there because they're public, but I'm not, I don't even want to say what these searches were. You can just imagine how terrible. This Google account also conducted over 200 searches between March of 2022 and June of 2023 relative to active and known serial killers and specifically the disappearances of Melissa, Maureen, Megan, and Amber. Those searches were, why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by the Long Island serial killer? Why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? Long Island serial killer. Long Island serial killer phone call. Long Island serial killer update. Long Island serial killer update 2022. FBI active serial killers. Serial killers by state 2023. Map of all known serial killers. Unsolved serial killer cases. America's five most notorious old cases. 11 currently active serial killers. Eight terrifying active serial killers. John Bitroff. He also Googled the names of the victims. Megan, Melissa, Maureen. He also Googled names of relatives of Melissa and Megan. Cops launched the Gilgo Beach Homicide Investigation Task Force. That was another search. Mapping the Long Island murder victims. Inside the Long Island Serial Killer and Gilgo Beach. The Gilgo Beach Killer Criminal Minds. In Long Island Serial Killer Investigation, new phone technology may be the key to break in case. This account also searched for a number of podcasts and or documentaries regarding this specific investigation and repeatedly viewed hundreds of images depicting the murder victims and members of their family. They show two news articles from Oxygen.com that was titled, This Case is Solvable. New Task Force Aims to Solve Long Island Serial Killer Case and Long Island Press put an article out, Cops Launch Gilgo Beach Homicide Task Force. The search warrant executed on the Springfield Manon AOL account revealed selfies taken by Rex and sent to others to solicit and arrange for sexual activity, which further linked him to the account and cell phone used to establish that very account. He was also linked to other burner phones. On May 19th of 2023, Rex was observed by law enforcement via video and field surveillance at a cell store in Midtown Manhattan where he purchased additional minutes which were added to that burner phone. He was already under surveillance at this point. Analysis of the Springfield Man 9 AOL account led to the discovery of another email Hunter 1903A3 at gmail.com. It was registered to a burner phone using the name Andy Roberts, which was the same name he used for the Tinder profile and the burner phone. He used this account on February 14th of 2021 to send an image of a prostitute from upstate New York between two of those secret Gmail accounts. His IP address was used on May 23rd, 2020 and July 3rd, 2020 to access gilgonnews.com to read up on the investigation into the murders. The same IP was used to accept the terms of service from Google for the T-Hawk Gmail account and also the same IP address used to book flights for Rex and his wife back in 2018. 
They did some DNA testing of hairs found on the bodies. On July 22nd of last year, an undercover detective recovered 11 bottles from a trash receptacle left for collection outside of Rex's home. Swabs were taken and sent for DNA analysis. So with Maureen, poor thing. Oh, this just breaks my heart. She was restrained by three leather belts. One was used to tie her feet, ankles, and legs. A human hair was found on the buckle of one of the belts. It was tested on December 18th, 2010, and was determined to be a Caucasian hair fragment. Amber was bound by three pieces of clear or white duct tape. A female human hair was found on a piece of tape inside the burlap wrapping in the vicinity of her head. The hair was Caucasian, European descent. The DNA tested concluding that Rex's wife could not be excluded as a contributor, but... You get this 99.98% of the female population could be excluded. Essentially, all the hairs found on these women belong to Rex's wife. Megan had been bound with clear duct tape. Two hairs were recovered from her body, one from outside the head area and one from the tape of the head area. These were deemed to be female with Caucasian or European characteristics, excluding 99.69% of the population compared to Rex's wife. Investigators believe the items he used to bind the victims actually came from inside his home. They know his wife was out of town when Megan and Amber disappeared. And as far as we know, she is not at all suspected in any of this. When the skeletal remains of Megan were examined, there was a male hair recovered from the bottom of the burlap that was used to wrap her body in. The sample was submitted on July 1st of 2020 to generate a DNA profile. On January 26th of this year, Rex discarded a pizza box in a public trash can in front of 385 Fifth Avenue. If you're on YouTube, I'm showing all these photos. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe and like the video, by the way. The pizza box was sent to the crime lab and a swab was taken from the leftover pizza crust. On June 12th of this year, comparing the samples, the hair found on Megan and the swab from the pizza crust showed that Rex could not be excluded as a contributor but 99.96% of the population could be excluded, which is pretty much a slam dunk. Just last week on July 13th, Rex was arrested on the streets of Manhattan. Searches of his residence and other locations are currently ongoing. At the time of his arrest, a burner phone was found on his person. The phone was linked to that T-Hawk email used to conduct online searches that were found by investigators. He had been under surveillance since spring of last year, and investigators had planned to just continue to follow him and build their case, but they ultimately wanted to send it to a grand jury. They decided to go ahead and apprehend him in the interest of public safety because Rex was continuing to hire sex workers. He was using false IDs and burner phones, and also he had permits for 92 different firearms. Investigators were seen this morning on Sunday carrying out at least four long-barreled firearms and several blue plastic boxes with weapons in them. A total of 11 bodies were found on this stretch of Ocean Parkway over the course of several months back in 2010 and 2011. Most were young women who were sex workers. The DA did not say if Rex is a suspect in any of those cases. His arraignment on Friday, the DA told the judge they also worried Rex was planning to flee the country or could target other victims if they waited to arrest him. His wife stood by him at the hearing. She was visibly upset, and when approached by reporters, she said, please leave me alone. I will not be saying anything. His attorney entered a not guilty plea on his behalf on Friday. He's being held without bond, and at the initial court hearing, he was a little smug, grimaced inside, and would puff his cheeks out and nodded as some of the charges were read. His attorney said Rex cried to him saying, I did not do this. At the press conference surrounded by the victim's families, the police commissioner Rodney Harrison said Rex Hewerman is a demon that walks among us, a predator that ruined families. The DA said the case against Rex is only beginning and they, they're still executing search warrants. They expect more evidence to surface. He said they knew the killer would be watching the investigation unfold very closely in the news. So that's why they kept a very tight lip from the time the task force was assembled for that very reason, knowing this guy was probably watching. He grew up in Massapequa Park and went to high school actually with actor Billy Baldwin. 
He started working in Manhattan in 1987. After learning of the arrest, Billy Baldwin tweeted, woke up this morning to learn the Gilgo Beach serial killer suspect was my high school classmate, Rex Hewerman. It was Burner High School, Massapequa, New York, class of 1981. He was married, two kids, and an architect. Average guy, quiet family man. Mind-boggling. Massapequa is in shock. I learned that Rex was married first in 1990 and then years later married his current wife, whose name is Asa Ellerup. She's of Iceland descent. They have an adult daughter together who works with Rex, and Asa has a son from her previous marriage, and that son has some special needs. Part of Rex's job was negotiating between New York's Department of Buildings and private architects, navigating the complex building codes of New York City. His professional demeanor impressed some of his clients while putting off others with his obsessive direction. He was seen in a video in 2022 bragging about his career, and in that interview, he said, when a job that should have been routine suddenly becomes not routine, I get the phone call. He said at home, he has an extensive library of obsolete books about building codes from the past century. On his website, his list of clients include the JFK Airport, American Airlines, New York's Department of Environmental Protection, Landmark Preservation Commission, where he claimed credit for hundreds of successful applications before city agencies and Catholic Charities. One property manager who worked with Rex told the New York Times he was a gem to deal with, highly knowledgeable, a big goofy guy who was a bit on the nerdy side. He worked very long hours and was available 24-7. He said Rex was devoted to his wife who, according to the property manager, had health problems and also he was devoted to his mother who was elderly and still alive. Another person who had contact with Rex in a professional manner while he was hired to oversee renovations on a building in Brooklyn Heights, said he had conflict with everyone and was so particular over everything that the board fired him. A former president of the Brooklyn Heights building board said Rex was cold and distant and creepy. He said there was a swagger and cockiness like I'm the expert and you are lucky to have me. Another person said that while some may see his demands as arrogant, he was good at shepherding things through. Police have descended on his home, which is also his childhood home that he repurchased in 1994, looking for evidence and any trophies he might have kept from his victims. They were seen carrying out a child-sized blonde doll that was kept in a large wooden glass case that had flowers as decorations. His home is run down and sticks out like a sore thumb, according to neighbors. The shrubs are not trimmed, the yard's a mess, and there's always wood in front of his house. His father was an aerospace engineer, and Rex would do woodworking in his dad's building. Now, his dad died in 1975 when Rex was 11. A former classmate said Rex was bullied in high school, but did fight back on occasion. Some of his neighbors saw Rex as just another city commuter. Others described him as, a, as creepy due to his disturbing and menacing behavior, with some neighbors not allowing their kids to go trick-or-treating at his house or just told them to avoid his house in general. One man decided to let his kids go there on Halloween just to try to get a peek inside the house. Rex came to the door and gave the kids a plastic pumpkin full of candy. It was overflowing. The man's wife, however, made the kids throw the candy out when she learned where it came from. One neighbor wasn't shocked at his arrest, saying that Rex was just creepy. Another neighbor told the New York Times he had run-ins with Rex, none of which were nice. He said hello to Rex one time, and in return, Rex was swinging an axe, cutting wood in his front yard, silently glaring at him between chopping and splitting mall. He had been seen sitting on his front porch watching TV on an old TV set while sitting right next to his chopped wood. One neighbor commented to someone that Rex probably had bodies in the house. Another next-door neighbor said they were shocked and said Rex was quiet and never bothered anybody. That neighbor had lived there for 30 years. One neighbor said he commuted by train to work daily, wearing a suit and tie and saying it's weird because he looked like a businessman, but his house was an absolute dump. He's already being compared to notorious serial killers such as John Wayne Gacy, who led a double life as a construction worker. And in an odd detail, he once stole several pieces of fruit in a Whole Foods from a bowl that was meant for children. And an employee saw him do this and called him out, saying that that's meant for the kids. Rex got really mad, yelled back, and it got so loud that a manager had to escort him out. 
When his face was seen on TV by a coworker there at Whole Foods, they immediately recognized Rex as the orange guy. Rex's arrest is the biggest since the arrest of David Berkowitz, who was known as the son of Sam back in 1977. Anyone with information is asked to call 1-800-220-TIPS, T-I-P-S. And so that's it for right now. I'm staying on top of this one. Very interesting. I'm glad there's resolution for the families. But I have a big feeling this is not going to be the last of his victims that are revealed. I think maybe, just totally my opinion, some more of those bodies that they found in that general area could very well be from Rex. But we will see. We'll wait for an official announcement from law enforcement. But that's it for now. You guys have a good evening. Mm -hmm.